Hey guys, thanks for joining me for this 71st episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Special guests on this episode include actor Peter Herman, the series Younger, now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. We'll also visit with Dr. Ian Smith, the host on The Doctors, talking about his new book, Fast Burn, The Power of Negative Energy Balance. We'll also visit with country singer Chris Cruzy. He's got a new radio single, Summer Song, and he'll also preview his upcoming single, Tie a Knot, which will be available May 7th. Of course, if you would, please take the time to subscribe, comment, leave some feedback, check out the shop, and of course, share with your friends. Now, you never want to hear your mom say, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. And you really don't want to hear her say that on Mother's Day, am I right? Well, there's a new survey that just asked moms what makes the most disappointed or annoyed on Mother's Day, which is coming up fast, by the way. It's May 9th this year, so kind of like a week and a half from now. Well, here are the top five things that make moms disappointed on their holiday. Number one, having to clean up after the party or meal, 47%. Number two, not being able to take a break from their everyday routine, 36%. Number three, Feeling exhausted at the end of the day, 33%. Number four, waking up early, 30%. And number five, not getting any time alone, 28%. Streaming on Paramount Plus now, younger, and we've got actor Peter Herman on the line with us this morning. First off, Peter, appreciate you taking some time to be on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Now, Peter, tell us uh, a little bit about the, the, the series streaming on Paramount Plus. And, man, the times we're living in, no better place to be than streaming right now, right? Boy, no, no better, yeah, no better place to be than streaming. Amen. And uh, uh, so the, the young, Younger in a Nutshell, I'll give you the, the, the quick synopsis, is a, uh, a woman named Liza Miller in her 40s after divorce. And, uh, she has a child. She re-enters the workforce in the industry where she used to work in publishing, right? And she finds, and she's being, in a very first episode, she's being interviewed by these two 22-year-olds who look at her like she's from Mars because she's 40. <laughs> and so, and, and that night, uh, you know, she drowns her sorrows at a bar and uh, gets mistaken for uh, 26, for a, some, uh, a woman in her mid-20s by a very, very handsome uh, uh, Brooklyn tattoo artist, and then uh, Liza's friend says to her, "Listen, if he can make the mistake, anybody can make the mistake." So she, is, in a sense, reinvents herself and re-enters the job market slash the world of millennials as a 26-year-old. And I, at the publishing company, play her boss, who falls head over heels uh, in love with this uncannily wise and uncannily mature 26-year, uh, 26-year-old. And so the question is, how long can she keep up her lie? How long can she keep up these two? Uh, uh, we 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 have a slow burn uh, love affair. The other one is as quick and hot and heavy. And whether she, whether the young man is the right man for her, whether I'm, I can't, I hate saying this, but whether the older man, that's me, uh, is, can't say it, um, is is the right one for her. And um, and our writers, you know, headed up by Darren Starr of Sex in the City wrote seven beautiful, complicated, very sexy, romantic, uh, incredibly well dressed. Uh, uh, we had incredible wardrobe, incredibly well dressed seasons um, uh, out of this, uh, out of that story. And we just came to an end. And we're, we were uh, we were just swimming in good writing and good friendships and really, really good story. And uh, you talked, Peter, about uh, the streaming being the place to be now. And with your time that you've had in the industry stage screen, uh, the, the small screen as well, I mean, would you have ever imagined whenever you first started out that people be watching your TV shows on their phone? Well, well listen, for, I, I'm still, I still marvel sometimes at the fact that, that um, I'm walking around with a little box that I can talk into and, and, and listen to and hear other people's voices and that it's not connected by a wire to the wall. So you know, I'm I'm so amazed at technology, and the thing, the incredible thing is with tech, with with all of it, before it happens, you can't imagine it. And if someone says it to you, it sounds just just absolutely silly. If somebody had said to me, "Yeah, people are going to watch your show on their phones," um, then you know, you sort of think it's science fiction and it's cool. Uh, and back then, you know, I'm still, uh, you know, I'm 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 still, you know, the uh, 
I'm, I'm still so dial up um, in kind of a, a, every aspect of my life. I'm, uh, but I think I think that the remarkable thing about streaming is that it really satisfies the modern, totally impatient mind. Right. So the the idea. I remember watching TV. And then you dutifully sat there every week and you watched your episode and then you waited till the next one. You talked about it the next day. And now the, the great thing is, but especially for a show like ours, uh, that, that, that really moves so quickly from one story point to the next. It's so great to be able to, to watch three episodes a night, four episodes a night. And the episodes are 24 minutes long, which is remarkable, you know, with ad time. Um, so you can really dig into the, the, these, these characters' lives in a really beautiful way and not only get, get, uh, get these little glimpses. You know, the, the fans and the viewers, they can actually just live with us for a bit, which is great. And, and Peter, you talked about being technologically uh, challenged. I, I understand that as well. We're of the same generation, so uh, th- that's cool. But what is maybe the biggest technological advance you had to make in this last, month, this last year? Oh, boy, what a question. You know what? It was, uh, it was my kids... Uh, go, doing remote school, you know, and I, and I have to say, they love it. I love it. I love having them around. I really do. And I think that it's, and, and with all, all due respect, to, and listen, I, I have, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not someone who, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's lovely, it's absolutely lovely for me to have, to have them in the house. I know that there are so many situations where people say, are you kidding me? I'm juggling two jobs, uh, you know, and, and three kids uh, trying to get them through their online schooling. So I have so much respect for uh, the way that people have, have made their way through the pandemic. Um, and I, I have to say, though, um, that, that being said, uh, the, I, I, I love being able to sit down for lunch with them during the day that they're not in a cafeteria, um, and I'm actually able to supervise what they eat. <laughs> you know, so it's not just like a bagel and mac and cheese. I can have a little bit more input um, in their choices. But but that's but that's really that, that's a, that was that's been a really that's been a, a really positive adjustment. Um, and then. You know, trying not to look like a zombie on my Zoom calls. Everyone seems to get the lighting <laughs> right, and I sit. I'm like, oh my! I see myself. I'm like, oh my god, I look awful. So, um, so, so, you know, uh, it's it's been an adjustment for all of us. Well, Peter, I understand that, and I just got one of those green screens at home for my Zoom calls and was asking my 16-year-old to come in and get me help, and we could never get any color in my face. She gave me the same thing, so I'm a zombie, too, on my Zoom calls, so so we're in good company. What, what, do, you put, what do you put on your background for the green screen? I, I have tried a million different things from my uh, from my podcast logo to just uh, I- anything, and, it, and I still look like a zombie regardless. Okay, yeah, I, I've been quite... As soon as, as soon as you figure it out, call me, because I can't... Uh, <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't quite do it. But that's you know the uh, and that's it was interesting on you know on on younger we there was the question about whether we incorporate the pandemic into the show right the writers room they asked should we shouldn't we uh, and they decided that it was a uh, too, just too heavy a lift right with uh, a tremendous loss of life uh, in to, to to incorporate that into a romantic comedy they said would have been. The, the, to be respectful in any way or realistic in any way um, would have been impossible. So it's uh, so it, we we all look, you know, you and I look like zombies on the um, on our on our Zoom calls. But man, oh man, it's a beautiful world there at our at our publishing office. That's right. And again, uh, check out Younger now streaming on Paramount Plus. And Peter, it's been great to have the chance to visit with you this morning, and uh, hopefully we can catch up again real soon. All right, thank you so much for having me, and all the best to you. Now see, this is what happens when people prioritize feeling good over looking good. And we've got to cut that out. Crocs has just reported that their sales were up 64% in the first three months of this year. And that big growth came after 2020, when they also had record sales with people choosing comfortable shoes over more attractive ones. 
Now Crocs is loving this new popularity and not just because they're raking in cash. Now tons of other companies want to collaborate with them, so look out for quote, interesting and buzzworthy Croc mashups coming soon. And along with that, here's one of those sentences you never could have imagined would have come out of your mouth. According to the founder of the beauty website, Violet Gray, quote, teeth have become the new boob job. What does that mean? Well, really nice, shiny white teeth are more in fashion than ever. So people are dropping big bucks to make their teeth look great. Now, Americans spent $9 billion on oral care products last year. And a big reason is all of the video calling where our teeth are now in full display. Got a new book to talk about with uh, Dr. Ian K. Smith, also the host of The Doctors, the book, The Fast Burn, The Power of Negative Energy Balance. And Dr. Ian, always great to visit with you, sir. Oh, thanks for having me. I always love talking to you. Now tell us, uh, melt fat, drop pounds. I mean, uh, you got me right there. Where, t- <laughs> how, how does this? How do you bring this down to the average Joe, uh, the the regular average day, everyday American? Well, it's built for the everyday American. Uh, Fast Burn is a nine week program. Every week on the program is completely different, so you don't get tired of doing the same thing. But also, it's made of regular, affordable food that's very accessible. You don't have to go to five different grocery stores. And it's good food. It's tasty food. The recipes in the back of the book range everything from steak, the tender baked pork chops on page 273, all the way to pasta, to salads, to Moroccan sweet potatoes. So the recipes are built for everyday people who don't want to give up taste just because they're eating healthier. And here's the beauty of it. You know, I tested 2,000 people in my Facebook group before the book was published. The average weight loss is 15 to 17 pounds in nine weeks. But beyond the weight loss, which is great, people are also dropping inches, particularly around the waistline, six inches, eight inches, because what the book is doing is I'm flipping you into a negative energy state, which means that your body is going to be driven into your fat stores to use that for fuel. So you shrink the fat, you convert it into fuel, and your body uses that for energy. So this is for the everyday person. Now, it sounds all well and good, Ian, but but is it really adaptable to everybody? Oh, my goodness. We have 9,000 people in our Facebook challenge, and people should join it. It's uh, called Fast Burn Challenge. It's on Facebook. Check out 9,000 people doing it together. Yes, this is for people who are on a budget, people who don't belong to a gym, people who don't want to go to a gym because there's exercise in the book, a whole chapter of things you can do with visuals right at home. The food, like I said, is completely normal. There's pasta, there's pizza some days, there's salads, there's seafood. I mean, it is regular food. And what people love about the program is the ease of use. I decided I wanted to write a book that was from the standpoint of the user, not necessarily what doctors want you to hear, but what is the experience. People want to drink a little bit of alcohol. There's alcohol in the book. People don't want to give up all their bread. There's bread in the book. But I do it in a way so that it's healthy and you're still able to lose weight. And Dr. Ian, how much do you think the success of this package also getting rid of the COVID-15 at least, uh, sometimes the 30 this last year, right? Right. Yeah. No, for sure. A lot of people, obviously, who've put on weight over the last year, understandably, the world has been upside down. People have been stressed out. People have been medicating themselves with food. I get it. But now that we're kind of turning the corner here, people are getting out and about. This is a great time now to focus on yourself. And with Fast Burn, I do it in a way so that you're not doing anything extreme, by the way. This is a gradual process where you're losing the weight, you're keeping the weight off. But remember, no program is worthwhile if you can't stick to it. And so this is built so that people every day, all your meals are spelled out for you with plenty of options. So you can be a vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, carnivore, it doesn't matter you can customize fast burn according to your preferences. Now, Dr. Ian, how much did this last 12 months of, uh, of quarantining and people being separate help you in your process of writing the book? I mean, I know that the doctors is keeping you busy too. I mean, where did you find the time, I should say? Yeah, well, I got to be honest with you. Usually I'm traveling a lot, um, you know, for work. But, you know, the positive side, the silver lining in the cloud of COVID was that I spent the vast majority of my time at home. I was able to write. I wrote two books uh, during the pandemic. Uh, but able really to focus on what my work should be, what I want it to be. So for me, it was a very prolific time, and Fast Burn, this new book, is a result of that. Also listening to people's 
suggestions in my Facebook group and hearing them say, I'd like this, I don't want that, try this. So that feedback to me is what really is important because, once again, the book is not about me. It's about creating a program that will work for the everyday American. And Dr. Ian, how much do you have to pay attention to also the mentality, the emotions as you're going through a diet plan and eating and, and trying to make transformation in your life anyway? Well, I, I always say that weight loss starts in the mind. I mean, you can have the best plan in the world. You can have the best gym or trainer in the world. And if your mind is not in the right place, if you aren't ready to change, then that plan, that gym, that trainer is not going to be productive for you. So I tell people all the time, Make sure you start when you're ready to start. And then when you're ready to start, then all of the resources that you have available to you, then they will be most productive and you will start achieving the results you're looking for. And Dr. Ian, how much are you looking forward to us returning to whatever the new normal is? And uh, I'm sure it'll make you uh, almost a pro as a host being able to, to have a, a little bit of normalcy, right? Well, I got to tell you, I am, I am out front of the line waiting to get back to some sense of normalcy. I think we're going to get there. Uh, the vaccinations are going well, uh, the numbers are going down nicely, and so I, you know, listen, I haven't been in the Rachel Ray studio for uh, over a year, and I'm there all the time with Rachel Ray. I miss being with her and the fans and the people in the audience. So, listen, I can't wait to get back to a sense of normalcy and travel and have fun, and we're going to get there, but we got to get there together. And again, the new book, Fast Burn, The Power of Negative Energy Balance. And Dr. Ian, like you mentioned earlier, I want to make sure that uh, folks have the information about the Facebook group, where they can find more info about the book, and then, of course, uh, everything you got going social media-wise as well. Yeah, they can join my group. It's called Fast Burn Challenge on Facebook. Just search for that. You can join it also on Instagram. If you don't have Facebook, follow me. I give great advice on that, too. My Instagram is at Dr. Ian Smith. Spell the doctor out. I-A-N Smith. All right. Well, Dr. Ian Smith, always great to visit with you, my friend. I hope you have a great rest of your week and uh, look forward to talking again real soon. You too. I always appreciate you having me. Thank you. I'm pretty sure when you buy a $5 package of Bagel Bites from the freezer section, you shouldn't be expecting gourmet pizza, but this woman was. A woman named Caitlin Huber from Juneau County, Wisconsin, just filed a class action lawsuit against Bagel Bites for being low quality pizza. Now she had two main issues. One, they don't actually use tomato sauce, just tomato ingredients and seasonings with no thickeners. And two, the cheese on the Bagel Bites isn't real mozzarella, even though it says, quote, real dairy on the box. Caitlin was especially upset about the cheese thing being from Wisconsin. The lawsuit says, quote, Dairy is more integral to Wisconsin than potatoes are to Idaho and oranges to Florida. Now, anyone in the state can join her class action suit over the deceptive packaging and quality of the bagel bites. And she didn't give a specific dollar amount she was looking for. That would be up to the court to decide. Now, bagel bites are owned by Kraft Heinz, and they haven't commented on the lawsuit. Our final guest on the podcast today got a single that is out and about now, and I think it's going to be one of the big ones of the summer as well. It's it's in the name. It's called Summer Song. Chris Cruzy on with us today. And Chris, first off, it's uh, great to have the chance to visit with you a little bit today. Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, I'm always, I'm, I'm always uh, happy when someone gives me a, a microphone and the freedom to speak. So, <laughs> now, that's always fun. Now, now, Chris, tell us a little bit about how music started for you. I mean, when did you pick up the first guitar or uh, get in front of the first microphone? When did you know that uh, music had a special place for you? Well, uh, we can go way back. I mean, growing up, we grew up in northern Wisconsin my whole life. And, uh, you know, basically what we did for fun in the summers is I, I went to Canada fishing with my dad. And uh, we camped a lot, like almost every weekend. And dad always had a guitar and he played, you know, cowboy chords sitting around the fire. And he had uh, like this, this Washburn 12 string and it was kind of, it just leaned in the corner of the basement. We weren't allowed to touch it. And so every, every chance I got, I'd sneak over there and strum those strings. And uh, you know, it was like, the the forbidden fruit um don't touch it <laughs> but every chance i got i'd go over there and strum the strings and then my mom and dad started to kind of 
cats that I was very interested in guitars. And I was a totally ADD, hyperactive, couldn't get me to focus kind of kid, you know, in kindergarten. And like the teachers were telling my mom and dad, put that kid on Ritalin or something, you know. And my dad said, well, I'm not going to do that. He said, we'll find something that we can use up his energy in. And so they bought me a guitar for my sixth birthday when I was in kindergarten. And uh, dad bought these little, little, uh, you know, like the little dot stickers, little tiny ones. And he uh, bought me that guitar and he put the first chord he showed me was a G chord. And he put those stickers on my fretboard and that's where my fingers went. And uh, after I got the G chord, he put them in the shape of a C chord. And once I got that, then I switched between the two and uh, so on and so forth. He showed me about five chords. And then uh, my dad was an MP in the military. And so uh, he had he had this giant collection of cassette tapes from his from his days that he was actually at Fort Hood, Texas. Mm -hmm. But um, he uh, he had this giant collection of tapes that he, you know, started started collecting when he was 18 and went to the military. And I had this giant, like this one, you know, you know, those, remember those stereos where it had like the top one was a radio. <laughs> yeah. The, the middle one had two cassette decks and then the bottom was a, like a 32 band EQ. Yeah. And, and I had one of those. And then I had these speaker cabs, like these boxes that my dad built and put speakers in. So they're just huge and way too loud, but I got to put that in my bedroom <laughs> and, I had all these tapes and like it, he had a drawer, like a piece of furniture built for cassette tapes. Um, I don't know if he still got it or not. I should find it. It'd be fun to have. But anyway, so in, in that, in that uh, drawer full of tapes, it was like, I mean, anything from like Hank senior, um, Hank junior, Merle Haggard, Willie Nelson, um, but, and then ACDC and guns and roses and Nazareth, Ted Nugent and, I mean, just all across the board, um, all kinds of music. And so I, dad had showed me these five chords and then I kind of figured out like bar chords, you know, where you could play them anywhere. And, um, just started listening to those songs and, you know, that, that started to try and play along with them. Um, I was obsessed with ACDC, <laughs> like obsessed. Uh, I mean, guitar heavy music was, attractive to me because that's what I was learning was guitar. Um, yeah. So I, I started taking off with that and I just had this little cheap kind of crappy acoustic guitar that they had gotten me from, I, I think they got it from like Sears or something. And I played that for about a year and I actually used to, it, it slept in my bed with me cause I'd play it at night and one morning I woke up and the bridge had popped off. And so I was like, Oh, that's terrible. Can't play my guitar now. <laughs> and, uh, so my dad had this, this other guitar that he took camping. It, it stayed in the camper all the time. And he said, well, I'll just go get the guitar out of the camper. You can keep that in your room for now. And I was like, sweet. And that was, uh, it looks just like a Gibson hummingbird, but it's like a Japanese made one. It just says pan P A N on the headstock. And, uh, it's actually kind of a cool guitar. I still have it, but he let me play that one for a little bit. And then one day I, uh, I got home from school and there was a brand new guitar sitting, sitting in the house. He picked up for me and, uh, I still got that one too. It's like an Abilene or something it's called. Um, I think it's like the knockoff version of a Martin. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I've just, I've been obsessed with it and, it was like the one thing that clicked in my brain. You know, I was a terrible student, <laughs> terrible student. Um, I always, now I always had respect for my teachers and got along great with my teachers and all the authority and whatnot, but I was an awful student. I, they couldn't get me to do homework for nothing. Uh, every time they'd go to, they'd go to parent teacher conferences and they'd both come up to me. You, are you all caught up? Like, are we going to be in for any surprises at conferences? And I was like, Oh yeah, it should be good. As far as I know. As far as I know, I'm I'm good to go. They'd come back with like a a three ring binder with a hundred pages of homework I haven't done, and <laughs> I'd, I'd give them the classic "What? What? How, how did that happen?" <laughs> I know I but, did that. What's that? You know you did that, right? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'd you know 
I was that guy. But um, yeah, the guitar was you know something that that made sense, and I I was obsessed with it, and that, that's all I wanted to do. And uh, yeah, so I mean, I kind of he showed me those first five chords, and then I I learned the rest listening to all those cassette tapes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Now the the new single the the summer song obviously as we get closer to the summer I mean when did this song come to you? Mm. Well, this song was pitched to me by um, a guy named Larry Fleet. Um, Larry's killing it right now too. He's got some songs on the, for sure on the indicator chart. Um, but uh, yeah, he sent it to me, and I it's just instantly it's like this is an anthem i want to play this on a festival whether it's my song or not you know um it's just it's a ton of fun and especially i think it was such a cool song for me because in wisconsin here like summer is like sacred territory all right (laughs) we've got three months of the year that don't suck and now you you adapt and you i mean we have fun in the wintertime too but like summer is sacred and so a song that kind of embodies all the fun things that we get to do in June, July, and August, it's just, it's even more special up here than it is a lot of other places because it's so short lived. Um, and I mean, if I think back to like, if I had to put a highlight reel of my life together, a lot of that stuff's coming from summer. And so it's just, I don't know. It's kind of, it's like a, every summer I get the same, I don't even, maybe this is going to be completely off the wall, but I don't know. Like, do you still have yearbooks from like when you went to high school? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. What's left of them. (laughs) I've got a few, I've got a few more years on mine than you do. Yeah. But either way though, I mean, like, you know, that nostalgic feeling that you get when you look through that stuff. Um, That's kind of what I got with this song. It felt like it felt kind of timeless and, you know, thinking back to summertime where, you know, you'd go to the, we'd go to the lake a couple of towns over and we'd run into our buddies that we go to school with, but it's in the summer. So we don't really see our friends a whole lot in the summer. I mean, we, uh, I live in the middle of nowhere. Like we were 10 miles out of town and mom and dad worked. So, I mean, we were home, we'd ride our bikes to town, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's just that, that cool nostalgic feeling of awesome memories if that makes any sense at all it does does. and i was listening to it and i and i thought of those summer festival type things and what were the what are the festivals that it specifically takes you to whenever you you're playing there or maybe the first time you heard it um well it's gonna it's it's a tiny tiny one but i I started playing it when i was in high school it's called it's just it's the ridgeland fair ridgeland wisconsin it's a town of 112 people and, but they do the Ridgeland Fair every year, and it was it's um, Labor Day weekend, and it was always that's always the time like we would reconnect with all of our friends from, from school that we haven't seen all summer, and you know we started school the next the following week, and uh, so that was always like the end cap to summer, and this little town of 112 people ends up with like 3,000 people in town for the fair, <laughs> and it's just it's a blast. I mean, everything, all, all kinds of, all the sketchiest carnival rides you can think of and a beer tent. They lift the open container laws for the township. So people are, you know, in and out of the bar. So the, the, the tent, they just sell beer and then the bars benefit because people want mixers and stuff. They can go in and get them and come outside with them. And, um, yeah, it's just a blast. It's just a awesome little small town, deal i love that stuff no no chris since the pandemic have you how have you had to adapt and have you had the chance to play any shows as things are starting to open up yet yeah yeah i've been you know luckily i've been able to stay fairly busy um you know we did a lot of live stream shows um you know with some sponsors and stuff and then a lot of private streams and stuff like for corporate events um so luckily we had some good relationships there to keep the lights on. Uh, but man, I, I, we're just now starting to get back out and play for real people, which is those live streams were great and they were what we needed to do. But man, there's nothing worse to me than just staring at a camera and you can't tell if people are even liking anything you're doing on the other end. There's no interaction. And I'm like, 
who gave who gave me a microphone and a camera? <laughs> I don't because this is weird. Like I'm sitting in my little studio at my house by myself. I have a tech come in and set it up because I don't know how to do that stuff. <laughs> and um, yeah, and I'm just staring at this camera and like I've got a computer next to me so I can like look through the comments and stuff. But it's so weird. You know, you're at a live show and I can say, how are you guys doing tonight? And then, you know, you get a response. <laughs> and for this, and I, I, I'm a, I'm a, like, I, I'm obsessed with like trying to read a crowd, you know? So when I was playing bars for four hours a night, I was playing 250 nights a year. Um, and, you know, you learn to, you know, I had a, just a, a ton of material that I could do. I was playing four hours by myself and, um, I would, you know, a lot of times I'd start off with maybe some classic country or something. Um, and, you know, you can kind of play a few different genres, classic country, do some classic rock, do some newer stuff, um, you know, just kind of see what the crowd is into and then kind of cater the rest of the set towards that. Um, but with a live stream, there's no, like, there's no feedback. I have no clue. So it's kind of, you just have to, like for those live streams, it's hard because I, you just have to kind of go and I don't know. It's weird. I, I, I admit I need, I need that crowd interaction. Um, it did, it did force me. It forced me to come up with things to talk about though. And so that, that part of it was really good. Now what's, the, what's the biggest thing that you really delved into in the time that you had separate during the pandemic? Was it the songwriting instrumentation vocals or maybe a, a pretty good mix of all of that? It was kind of all of it. Yeah. Uh, one of the big things I did was, um, I, I learned how to like shoot and edit my own video and stuff. So I'm doing most of that stuff myself now, you know, making lyric videos and, um, a lot of social media content. Cause that's kind of the name of the game now. Um, just putting that content out. And so that gets really expensive if you can't do it by yourself. And so I dove into that and figured out how to edit and it's it, i actually enjoy that and then you know i spent a bunch of time in nashville writing and recording and yeah just it, and you know i've also got a wife and two young kids at home so we you know last summer yeah it sucked that all those festivals were canceled and stuff and i don't want people to hate me hate me for saying this but that was might have been one of the most fun, fun summers i've ever had yeah. no. and just just because i was like everything's canceled. I'm not just going to sit at home and do nothing. We got to at least find the silver lining here and have some fun. Um, you know, I had, I had all this free time. We camped and we, we've got a little old crappy boat, but it runs good. Kids love tubing behind it and stuff. So, I mean, we got to do a ton of that last year. And then as far as yard work and stuff, we got 10 years of stuff done last spring. So, I mean, there was, there was some benefits to it. Um, I wouldn't certainly don't want to do that again, but yeah, I mean, I, I probably did more, more hunting and fishing than I have in 10 years last year as well. So that was, that was good. I got to get my four year old boy out in the woods with me, do some deer hunting. So that was fun. That's good stuff. Now, what, what do you think you learned most about yourself in this time? Cause we, you've had so much time obviously to sit and really think and be with your own thoughts. What, what'd you learn about Chris Cruzy? I think one of the biggest things that I, I learned and took away from it is, you know, I'm always, I'm always focusing on like, what's the next step in this career that I've got going, you know, what, what's this next um, level going to look like? Um, what are the steps to get there? Um, you know, if I put a single out and it does a couple hundred thousand streams on Spotify, and then I look at someone like Luke Combs, who's got hundred million streams. And it's like, I think I kind of, a big thing for me was really sitting back and thinking about what the real important things are in my life. Um, you know, obviously I want my music career to keep going and keep growing, but, uh, at the end of the day, any business that anyone's doing, I firmly believe that, biz I mean, the whole point of business is to benefit your personal life. And so if my personal life suffers because of my business, you know, obviously there's going to be some sacrifices and that's, that's okay. But if your personal life isn't, isn't truly benefiting from your business, then what's the point of it anyway? And so for me, I, I think it was just good to, 
kind of work that out in my own head and not, not get down on myself if I'm not, you know, getting these big leaps like, like everybody wants. Um, just, uh, you know, looking at, looking at all the positives. And I mean, I look back five years ago, I mean, my life is completely different than it was five years ago. Um, and so, you know, honestly, I, I, I can't complain with where I'm at. I want to keep growing and all that. But uh, that might have been the biggest thing was just, you know, accepting where you're at in life. It, it, a lot of people are, me included, you know, you're looking, you, you sit and envision your future and it's this fictitious time frame when everything's perfect. And it's, that's just, it, that's never happened. I mean, that's, that fictitious time frame doesn't come. This is your life. So um, enjoy it, <laughs> you know? Now, Chris, I know that uh, we talked before we came on about uh, possibly playing something for us. I don't know what you had lined up. Maybe you wanted to do like a like an intro of uh, of something you were going to play for us today. Yeah, how about uh, how about uh, a single that's coming out to Spotify and Apple Music here on May seventh? This one, I'm really excited about this song. It's a total um, perfect fit for what this last year was. It's called Tie a Knot. And um, it's all about, you know, digging in, digging your heels in and um, finding finding every way that you can to survive during all this craziness and keep the lights on. And, um, you know, driving around small town Wisconsin here, there's unfortunately there's a lot of little family owned bar and restaurants and stuff that have closed on the windows because they just couldn't survive. And, um, you know, this to the analogy is. If you're at the end of a rope, you know, you're about to fall off, tie a knot, you have a better chance of holding on. So this is, this one's about finding what it is to hold on and don't give up. Here it is, tie a knot. As long as this world's been spinning, light's been fighting dark. Life's been handing out lemons Love's been breaking hearts Yeah, history repeats itself So if you learn one thing from that Nobody's ever won nothing From raising that white flag When you're rock bottom Give that devil hell If you've got problems gonna hurt to ask for help if your back's against the wall swing with everything you got if you're at the end of the road tie a knot we've all got monsters hanging round under our beds and out on the street Taking on crazy, gotta show them how crazy you can be. Don't throw the towel, roll up the sleeves. When you're rock bottom, give that devil hell. You got problems, ain't gonna hurt to ask for help. If your back's against the wall, swing with everything you got. You're at the end of the rope, tie a knot. You're at the end of the line, the one hope if you feel like letting go. At the end of the line, the one hope if you feel like letting go. At the end of the line, the one hope. Feel like letting go, tie a knot. When you're rock bottom, give that devil hell. If you've got problems, ain't gonna hurt to ask for help. If your back's against the wall, swing with everything you got. If you're at the end of the rope, tie a knot. 
Tie a knot, Chris Cruzy, and uh, Chris. I know you said you kind of reevaluated how the goals and uh, what you're looking forward to. Now, as uh, as 2021 progresses, how has that goal setting changed? The, the new single coming up next month. Aside from that, uh, moving into the summer. And uh, this summer is looking phenomenal so far. I mean, I'm just clicking through my calendar here, and it's you know I've got. I don't have any weekends open. They're all booked. Um, it's going to be a ton of fun. Um, can't wait. And I'm super excited. Uh, not next week, but the following. So May 10th, 11th, and 12th, I'm getting together with my band for the first time since January of 2020. Wow. And um, we're going to rehearse for three days and try and shake the, the rust off as good as we can. Um I can't wait for that. That we we're putting together a brand new show. We've got a bunch more original music, some stuff that we've I've never even cut. Um, but uh, yeah, just putting together a, a kick-ass live show is a big part of this spring. Um, you know, with the single coming out, um, it's that's always good. You know, at, at the very least, it it's something awesome to talk about on stage. And I, you know, there's a lot of good stories around the single tie a knot and then we've got summer song going to radio um so there's a lot going on actually um a lot of festivals which is awesome um and a lot of like small town acoustic like super fun st- i love finding like I've, I've played a few shows at uh it's a, it's a wedding barn but like those wedding venues some of, they're like the perfect like 200 seat venue you know they're, it's so cool. It's fun. It's a unique environment, and I love those crowds because they're for one, they're buying a ticket for the music, and so they're there to listen, which is great. Now, I love a bar party, but a bar party is very different than a sit, you know, a listening room concert. Um, and I've grown to love those listening room ones just because you know I can sit on a stool and you know, talk about writing songs or talk about the studio or you know and talk about stupid funny stuff that i've done and um it's you get to connect with people one of my favorite ones i i I always play digging up bones by randy travis and uh so the funniest thing happened is a couple years ago i was at a festival in minnesota and there was legitimately like five thousand people in the crowd and now i was opening for um little big town but (laughs) (laughs) uh my wife, it was my wife and I's five year wedding anniversary. And she came out to the show and she was standing on the edge of the crowd. And I pointed her out to the crowd and like, we were, the band was already like vamping on digging up bones. And I just wasn't paying attention to where we were in the set. And I had like called out my wife for our anniversary and, you know, said, this one goes out to you and everybody cheered. And then I sang freaking digging up bones. And it was the worst the worst possible song to ever dedicate to your wife. <laughs> but it's a really funny story now. So the, This long distance dedication sent out to uh, Chris Cruzy and his wife. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it, the, the second verse is the worst. It's like, I knew I was screwed when I started it, but it's like, I went through the jewelry and found our wedding ring, put mine on my finger, and I gave her the fling. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and my fiddle player my fiddle player is losing it when i'm doing this on stage she's like you can't even hold it together unbelievable you talked about having to stay on top of the social media which of the social media platforms is the most difficult for you to stay on top of all of them i hate it i hate everything about it but um I do it though, because it's a good way to connect with people and it's important in the industry. Now, Uh, if it was up to me, I wouldn't do it at all, but I need to, uh, I don't know. I mean, I I guess I'm on Twitter. I just kind of push stuff from Instagram there. I have no clue how Twitter works or the point of it, but it's there. There's a lot of people on it and I, I'm sorry for all the Twitter people out there. I just don't get it. Um, I, I mean, I never had internet growing up or anything. We didn't have this stuff. Um, I grew up in the woods and we had a, a bunny ears antenna on top of the TV that didn't really work. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's hard for me to, 
sit down and stare at a screen for any length of time. I hate it, but it's important. And some of, some of it can be fun, you know, going through the comments and having conversations with people and whatnot. But a lot of people struggle with that too. It's, it's kind of a gross, kind of a gross thing where, you know, I feel bad, especially for, there's some, you know, when I was on the voice, um, there was like, you know, 13, 14 year old girls on, on TV and they've got social media and people are rotten on the internet. I mean, absolutely rotten. And like, for me, for lack of a better term, I could give two shits less what people think. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I just don't care. Like I'm, me and a, a couple buddies out in LA, like one of our things that we would do was we would like go to YouTube and find each other's videos from that night. And we'd like round up the five nastiest comments we could find and we'd share them with each other. Cause it's funny. But I feel bad for these, you know, those kids, they take that stuff to heart and it's, it's, it could be pretty nasty. Now, did you, did your time on the voice, did that help you get ingrained into the social media a little bit? I mean, you probably had a little coaching there, didn't you? Oh yeah, for sure. I, yeah. I mean, I probably, I think I had like 10,000 followers on Facebook or something before I went out there. And then by the time I got home, I had like 60,000 or something. And so, I mean, it was definitely... Yeah, definitely a lot. I mean, I'm still learning. It seems like every time I start to figure it out, they change it. Uh, I mean, even like, I understand algorithms and stuff are going to change all the time, but just like the button to go live or whatever, I'm like, where is it? It was here last time. (laughs) It's the small things. It's the small things, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Now, Chris, who are, who are the artists, maybe the songwriters that, uh, that, that are out there right now that inspire you? Oh man. I mean, there's, I don't, I guess I don't know specific like songwriters and stuff, but, um, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, Billy strings. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Um, he's a bluegrass guy he's from Michigan and he's just like, you watch him play guitar and it's like, he's gotta be one of the best flat, flat pickers out there at all ever. And just watching him, it's like one of those things where you don't know if you should practice or quit. Um, <laughs> But I love watching that. Like just those people that are, you know, there's, I can play guitar. I can play lead. I can take solos and I can, I can do impressive stuff on there, but there there's, there's just people out there who are just a different breed, you know? Um, Cause I can learn songs and I can play cool parts, but there's just some people that it's just like engraved in their soul or something. And they just, it just naturally comes out. Um, and so Billy Strings is one of those. And then other guys, Marcus King, uh, he's phenomenal. He's got a really cool voice. He sounds timeless. He sounds like, he, I mean, he doesn't sound like he looks at all, um, which I love that. And then, I mean, obviously, I mean, I love like Chris Stapleton. I was a huge, huge fan of Zach Brown band. Um, and that one was, like pretty important to me because that we, my brother and I, you, now I'm going to date myself. I'm not that old, but I don't know. Um, so when I was in high school, that was uh, back when like Walmart had the big CD section. Yeah. And we used to just go through there. We'd buy a few CDs once in a while. They'd be on sale for like five bucks or something. And we found this CD with this like broken, dirty Mason jar on the front of it. And we bought it listen to it and it was awesome it was the, the foundation by zach brown band yeah and it was this was like prior to chicken pride even being a big radio single and i think it was in 2007 and so i mean i i dove into that record and then especially once we started hearing chicken pride on the radio then i i dove in even harder and i learned every song on it note for note and so that was you know that was really important developmental years for me as a musician and that's the, that's the stuff i was super into at the time well, that's cool stuff now chris if folks want to keep up with that social media that you hate having to keep up with and also <laughs> the uh the the new single that's coming out in a couple of weeks and uh, upcoming tour information and all that where's the best place for folks to uh to keep up with it um i would i mean instagram or facebook one of the two or both um they're they're pretty much i mean i for an eye i mean they're pretty much the same same stuff i run both of them um yeah instagram and facebook i'll have 
you know, I've got links on Instagram and links on Facebook for my website and all that. And that's where my schedule will be posted through, um, bands in town, um, on my website and stuff. Um, yeah, that's, that's the best. And certainly YouTube, I try and put stuff out on there too. Um, yeah, just all that stuff. I, I try it. I try, I do my best. I, I should probably do more, but I'm doing more than I used to because I mean, there's times when I'd go three months and be like, Oh, I should probably post something, but <laughs> that messes that. the algorithm up a little bit, Chris. Yeah. So I'm a little better about it now. Um, but yeah, that that'd be the places I would check out. All right. Well, Chris, it has been great to have the chance to spend some time with you today, brother. I, I truly appreciate your time. And hopefully, brother, as you open up and get some uh, tour dates scheduled, we can get you up closer to us down here. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Appreciate you having me. Um, yeah. Hopefully I'm not too much of a bumbling idiot. But um, if I am, I am. I own it. <laughs> Well, thanks again for joining us for this 71st episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. If you ever have a comment, question, or anything else you'd like to know, just hit me up on the contact page at gqwithcam.com. You can also find me on the socials, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at gqwithcam. If you'd like to help out in the funding for this podcast, visit our merch store, there's hoodies, mugs, tumblers, shirts, stickers, and more, gqwithcam.com forward slash shop. Also, if you'd like to make a one-time monetary donation to the podcast, you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash gqwithcam. If you have a special guest idea, email me, gqwithcam at gmail.com. Thanks again to our good friend Brandon Allen for coming up with our theme music. We're going to let him play us out and hope you guys have a great rest of your Wednesday.